This week on CrossFeed. Is Jesus part of your love triangle? Atheist chaplains. Churches, moral issues, and tax exempts tax exemptions. Self-financing missionary trips. And E.T. Bone Rome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. He says that so well. I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. Welcome, everybody, to, uh, to episode 148. We are two away from number 150, and uh, so looking for ideas. If there's something special that, uh, if you have any ideas how we can celebrate it, uh, do something a little different or whatever, um, fire off your comments and suggestions to uh, podcast at crossfeednews.com. I'm afraid someone will say, why don't you just quit? <laughs> well, after our, the stuff, the, the stories and that that we do tonight, that may just happen. Um <laughs> Um, hey, I had a really interesting week. Um, I did a, a visit to someone who is, uh, it's a, a couple who are uh, Mormons, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And we had a really cool talk uh, about what Lutherans believe um, and uh, and what Mormons believe. And and I was really... And you became Mormon. <laughs> Uh, nope. <laughs> but I found that I was in agreement with them on a lot of stuff, um, that I didn't expect to be in agreement with them. We talked about, um, the role of faith and works in their relationship to each other. And, um, and, and basically both of us, both of us agreed that, uh, we're saved by, um, because God loves us because he's our father and because he sent Jesus to pay for our sins on the cross and that good works are um, a natural response of faith. And, you know, and they worded it a little bit differently. But then, you know, I kind of ask them, what did you mean by that? And, you know, and stuff. And, and we talk about kind of getting to kind of defining terms and stuff like that. And I was just, I mean, I was stunned because most Mormons that I talk to, when you get right down to it, now, obviously, we have a very different understanding of who God is because we're Trinitarian and they're not, and um, and and we didn't really get into the definition a whole lot of of salvation. And like, if you go to LDS.org and and look up salvation, there's like seven different definitions. Um, but we talked about I use the expression, and and this is probably the the closest way to talk about it. Um when you're talking with Mormons so that you're using the same terminology is being in the presence of God. All right. And, um, and so I said, you know, to, to have that, um, you know, we believe that that is a gift that, um, that God has given to us, um, because Jesus paid for our sins and, and he eliminated that, which was, um, that, that came between us, uh, and him. And, um, and and we agreed, and I was just I was really excited. I, I thought that was really cool, and and you know obviously uh, those those differences of uh, you know our understanding of the you know the, just the basic nature of God, the, the Trinity, and, and things like that um, are pretty major, you know, and um, and we just we didn't really discuss those except just to say yeah we definitely disagree on that, um, but we were both kind of excited to say wow. <laughs> um, so I thought that was really interesting. And, and so, you know, just in case we have any um, Mormons watching this, and I'm, I'm going to tag uh, the title of this episode in, in hopes that there are some that happen to catch it, um, that f- see the link via Twitter or something like that. And um, I, would, I would love to hear you explain or, or describe your understanding of the role of faith and works. Um, because I, you know, and I think what it came down to is, as we were discussing it, I thought, you know, a lot of Lutherans you talk to are going to give um, a, more of a works-oriented answer, 
and uh, just because they're not really um, instructed well enough in the um, in the Lutheran understanding of grace and works. And so um, I guess the same holds true uh, in any religion or, um, you know, or, or Christian denomination or whatever um, that it, you're going to find people uh, in uh, both kinds uh, or, or, you know, in different directions and stuff like that. So it was just, it was really educational. I, uh, I just, when I left, I just, I, I just felt really excited and happy and, and it was just a really neat experience. Skippy! I'm so happy! Cool. I don't think you're happy enough. Okay. So, where should we begin today? Oh, well, since we're talking... <laughs> well, since we're talking about Mormons, let's talk about, uh, I don't know, which ones. Well, um, you know, one thing that uh, that Mormons definitely believe in is life on other planets. Um, ah, okay, okay. I was thinking gay, gay marriage, but then I realized that that article doesn't. That's main, not uh, 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 proposition eight. Yeah, so no, it's on uh, the other coast. So um, this <laughs> this one caught my eye just because um, the the first line was <laughs> just awesome. Et phone roam. <laughs> we were watching um, um, monsters versus aliens. Um, on DVD, and uh, in there they they shoot a, a missile, and it says on the side of the missile "ET go home" or something like that, and um, and and my wife and I laughed, and my kids went what? Because they've never seen ET. Oh um, man! Yeah, we're 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 gonna make a point of making sure that they see it, but um, the younger ones would not be able to handle it. There's so this. anyway, uh, the uh, the uh, Vatican has hosted a five day conference on the question of whether or not there is alien life out there. Um, now, if you look at things from an evolution evolutionistic viewpoint, it makes perfect sense that there would be life out there, because why should we be the only one that um, you know life evolved on? If, however, you believe that we are a very special creation of God made in his image, then that makes uh, everything else completely different. Then then the, the question of life on other planets becomes a lot more iffy. Yeah. I mean, because if you believe in evolution, then obviously, you know, some of these people might have, you know, gotten ahead of us and done better and... Made pyramids and things like that. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> or you know, the whole um, Zenu and <laughs> and the, what, what are those things that they put into the atmosphere? I, I keep wanting to say midi chlorians, but that's something else entirely. <laughs> but that was a long time ago. <laughs> so maybe they, you know, transferred from that galaxy over to this galaxy. Um, <clears throat> reality is. Um, yeah, yeah, but that that was Gene Roddenberry's argument for Star Trek was that you know life would have evolved on other planets, you know, because evolution was real. Although I've also heard, I mean, I'm talking atheistic evolutionists say that really, um, the the way the the, the 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 things that needed to come together in order for life to happen and appear and evolve on our planet that it's so improbable that there's a pretty decent chance that there is not life on other planets or at least not intelligent life. Um, so I've, I've heard both sides. And, and again, that was not, I was kind of surprised to hear that from someone who was not, uh, you know, a theist or, a, um, or specifically a Christian, um, or, you know, somebody that, that sees uh, man in that way. So of course, now if somebody spends some time watching television, they may question whether or not intelligent life is just on <laughs> well, you know, our planet. I, I've always thought that if there is intelligent life out there, there may be a reason they haven't contacted us. <laughs> you know, 
Like, yeah. okay, we do not want them to know that we're here. <laughs> they will kill us. <laughs> you know? Um, C.S. Lewis addressed that question actually in his, uh, science fiction, uh, trilogy, uh, Out of the Silent Planet, Paralandra, and That Hideous Strength. And especially the first and second books. Um, and in fact, the, the second book, Paralandra, actually, um, Dis- uh, approaches the question of if how would the fall of man into sin affect life on other planets and he basically um, suggests he the book kind of turns into an allegory but um, he basically suggests that each planet is separate and um, and so for instance they see Earth appears upside down, and um, and it uh, there each like redemption basically it when when the fall happens on he's actually on uh, Venus and the fall happens there and then uh, it the redemption needs to happen there separately and so there's you know I've I've Read debates. No, about. they don't fall there. There's no fall on Paralandra. He prevents it. Oh, that's right. That's right. But he sort of he ends up. It, it's like redemption before the fall, though, because he he makes the sacrifice to to prevent it. So, anyway, be all that as it may, it's a very interesting conversation. But I honestly don't think life's out there on other planets. I don't think. Um, Aliens came and made the pyramids, um, you know, and uh, and well, I don't infiltrated think infiltrated the Vatican, and they're really lizard creatures. I have no idea what that meant. You've been watching V. I watched it in the nineteen eighties. <laughs> Sorry, I caught it on the first time it came around, but you notice the Vatican begins with a V. Hey, God bless, brilliant. There you go. No, actually, if if anybody is watching it, I've I've only watched the first two episodes. The third one's recorded on the TiVo, and I haven't watched it yet. Um, but they actually sort of address that question, and um, and there's there's these two priests on it, and one of them is is trying to figure it all out, and the other one is, um, I, I'm guessing at least they're sort of playing it up that he's probably one of the the V's, um, one of the aliens, um, in disguise, and. Uh, but in in this in the newer series they've you can't tell the difference uh they don't have that weird voice thing like in the first one and uh so they've infiltrated all of our different you know churches and and government and, and everything else so um but there's some i just because we're we're on this story and because this is kind of a current thing um there's a couple things that i caught in the um especially the pilot episode uh, they're in one of the motherships, and they've got apples uh, floating in this. Uh, they're demonstrating their mastery of gravity, and so they've got apples floating there. And one of them takes an apple and kind of holds on to it, sort of uh, kind of offering it to one of the humans. That and and these are the humans that they're trying to uh, to dupe into being their. Um, uh, their ambassador squad or something like that, and it just kind of hit me the oh, so here we have the reptile offering the apple to the human, tempting them, and I just thought, oh, hmm, <laughs> and and I didn't even think of it until after the show, um, like the that next wasn't day. that Supergirl who did that? I think that was Supergirl, Kara Vanderboop from. Uh... He was formerly on Smallville playing Supergirl. Oh, see, I haven't watched Smallville. Something's wrong with you. Really. Uh, do I, should I continue doing this podcast with you? <laughs> you know, we are way off the topic here. Let us move on here. The, the audience is probably getting bored going, what is with these two? Um, <laughs> you know what? If those two priests keep it up on me, they're going to lose their tax exemption. <laughs> okay. Weird. This is a weird show tonight, folks. <laughs> I think Gail's in a weird place. Anyway, so um, um, 
So anyway, um, <clears throat> up here in beautiful Maine, uh, just a little bit north where I'm from, uh, of course, that, uh, it was the 31st state in the country that has voted on gay marriage, and it was the 31st state in the country to <laughs> uh, vote against it. So, uh, hmm, how many states have gay marriage? Well, how many states have Supreme Courts and very difficult constitutions to change? That'll tell you something there. Um, <laughs> uh, it... Uh, if uh, New Hampshire passed it by legislature, but it's, they have a very difficult constitution to change. But anyway, um, where it does come up for a vote, it has consistently lost. And in Maine, it lost. And now the um, uh, 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 people who lost, obviously, is not real happy about that and are complaining that uh, the Catholic diocese and other churches, uh, you know, handed out signature cards and told people, you know, during the service um, to vote on this, uh, you know, vote on yes on one, um, to uh, uh, repeal it. And uh, they said, well, the IRS clearly forbids churches from participating in campaign, political campaigns in any form. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, 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 and so they're going to go through then, again, go out to the, uh, 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 to get the IRS to go after these churches and re- to remove their tax exempt status. The only problem is I'm not sure they're so right. I don't know yet, Pinky. Say that again. You're not sure what? I'm not. I don't think they're right in their argument. The um the group the what are they called? Main, Main marriage, marriage equality. equality. Or, yeah. yeah, they, they're, 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 okay. as I understand it, if it's a moral question or something like that, the churches easily can speak on it. What we can't speak to is, um, a particular political candidate. Are you a God fearing man, Senator? Or, um, you know, something, or, or something that might be really kind of far afield, of, I don't know, um, how much the budget for Massachusetts should be. Right. But, you know, but on the other hand, I mean, I don't hear them, you know, uh, uh, a lot of them, a lot of the Catholic bishops are pushing for U.S. health care. I haven't heard a lot of people complain about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, although the Catholic Church is kind of split on that one um, because you've got, on the one hand, they really want, there's a lot that really want the universal health care, and on the other um, side, they want, um, there's, there's the stuff in there about abortion that would ultimately end up in taxpayer, um, sponsored abortion. And, uh, and they're saying, oh, well, no, not, not that part. And so there's some debate about that. But, um, yeah, I, I think they're kind of out on a limb here. Now, okay. So I was thinking about this and I was thinking, and I was trying to kind of look from this, group's perspective okay um because we've talked before about different um bills and stuff like that where even if it was a pro-life bill and you have a pro-life um church and you say okay but could somebody in good conscience and in agreement with uh, still in agreement with the teachings of their church vote against such a bill and um and jim you, you actually mentioned on when um south dakota uh, decided to outlaw basically abortion, and and you said no, I'd be against doing that because it's it's just a waste of money because it's just going to get repealed right away, and you know, and um, and and so you know, I was thinking about this: is this something that somebody could say? Well, um, I I don't I don't think this is the right way to approach it. You know, it's the same argument that, that people have on that say I'm against abortion, but I'm pro-choice um, in, in the sense that I think that if we're going to uh, if we're going to get rid of abortion, it's, it's got to be by changing hearts, not by changing laws. And um, which is true to some degree. But the problem is when you legalize something, um, it becomes acceptable in society. You know, it's, it's sort of like um, parents don't put their kids in, in uh, car seats and seat belts until it's the law, 
<laughs> and then all of a sudden they do. Um, but, uh, I couldn't come up with a, a way to, when it comes to, um, uh, something that, that's clearly, um, the Bible, uh, speaks to the issue of marriage, um, and the definition the Bible gives is one man, one woman for life. And, um, of course I've said before that in our society, we've already thrown out the for life part. So it doesn't take much, you know, at that point where you you're going to play with the other, um, parts of it. So, but I mean, and we've hashed through that so many times, um, that it's, you know, we've gone off topic enough, but, um, you know, as far as the, the whole tax exempt thing, you know, churches traditionally have, have spoken on moral issues. It, I mean, it's, in fact, it, it's one of those things that it, it, it's actually a kind of a problem that something that bothers me is the fact that most people, when they think of churches, they only think of the moral issues and, um, because they don't understand the gospel and they think that the moral issues is where you stop. And well, no, actually, well, it may be where we stop, but it's not where we start. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, I, I really don't think they've got a leg to stand on this one. Right. I, 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 I mean, on the other hand, I mean, do I understand the frustration? Well, I don't believe in gay marriage, but then when, when you're deciding something like this and it's going to be at a vote, you're using very blunt instruments because you don't have time to talk about any type of nuance, any type of compassion, any type of care. Uh, one group's hitting you over the sledgehammer, and the other group's going to hit back. And that's mm-hmm. really, you know, and that's kind of what it comes down to. Um, and so I never like votes like this um, mm-hmm. because it, they, they're, by their nature, they're very divisive. I mean, even though it did pass, it, it only passed by, it was 53, uh, 47. So it wasn't, you know, like there's a huge thing, uh, there. So, uh, but no, I think their, their idea of, no, we're going to get rid of it. I think you're, the, the tax exemption, I think you're barking up the wrong tree. Uh, however, maybe some of these priests can go out and earn their own pay, uh, if they do lose their tax exemption. <clears throat> Now, this is an interesting article from the Wall Street Journal that uh, basically uh, about how some uh, Christian missionaries, instead of running around and trying to raise up funds, are actually starting businesses overseas and using those businesses then to pay for them to go out and um, do their uh, missionary work overseas, as well as giving training and things to people who are overseas in, in terms of work and jobs and stuff like that. And then using uh, that business to make connections and, and sort of do evangelism work through the business, through, uh, it says the, they build trust with locals through business relationships and minister every day of the week, not just Sunday, to employees, vendors, suppliers, and customers. I mean, you run a business, you got contact with a lot of people. Right. Um, yeah, th- really, this is, I, I, you know, uh, our our district, uh, Newland District, is very involved with with Kenya and supporting Kenya. One of the things we've done in Kenya is help build factories where people can get jobs. I mean, uh, that's part of you know uh, a lot of human care is this whole area of work, and so it really is a really good thing. Um, I think in a lot of different ways, so long as the business is done like, with integrity and with honesty and good things like that. Right. And, you know, and the reality is if, if you're running a, a um, business, really the goal, I, I mean, I, I believe that the goal of any business should be to make the world a better place through providing some uh, product or service that is going to benefit people. You know, mm-hmm. and if, and if your business isn't doing that, then it has no business being in business. Um, and, uh, you know, I, when I, um, was considering the call to come here to the Cleveland area from, uh, from Iowa, I, you know, I, I was thinking, well, you know, gee, it's a little different, uh, for pastors when they're considering, uh, um, 
basically a job opportunity. Um, because, you know, most people say, well, what are the benefits? What are, you know, what's the pay and all that kind of stuff? And, um, and, and how does it compare to where I'm at versus, you know, whereas with a pastor, it's more, um, well, uh, who can I help here and, and, and how can I serve people here compared to how can I serve people there? And, you know, and, and so as I looked at the big picture, um, it, there were just a lot more opportunities um, to, to serve here, um, with someone with my particular, um, skills and that. And, and so that was really the main, um, driving force to me coming here. But then I thought about it and I said, you know, really anybody that's considering a job, what they really should consider is how can I help people? And I mean, I think, frankly, I think that businesses that operate from that standpoint that say, you know, we want to make the world a better place and, and so we're going to provide the best possible product and the, or the best possible service and, and that, um, I think it'd be good for business too. You know, it's interesting, um, because within Christianity, uh, mission and missiologists have always recognized a thing called redemption and lift that when people become Christian, they also then begin to uh, um, increase their income, and they take more. You know that 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 Protestant work ethic. You know, if man does not eat work, he will not eat. Does really tend to take effect in people's lives, and so they they, they actually the sociologists actually call it redemption and left. When Christianity comes into an area, uh, the standard of living tends to rise up. And uh, interesting enough, early one of the early um, accusations about churches <coughs> by Rome was that they ruined the economy because uh, wherever churches went in, they the uh, um, trade for idols went downhill. Oh, yep, yep. Uh, as people left the idols, but they they found, but they turned to begin to do other work, um, and purely acts of mercy and stuff. So it's kind of an interesting uh, little. Uh, I don't know, combination there. You know, there is a biblical precedent for this. I mean, Paul was basically the original missionary, and he was a tent maker. And he continued his tent making business while he was on his journeys when the opportunity presented itself. So he didn't accept a salary, even though he <laughs> said that, you know, uh, um, that it, it was legitimate to pay a, a pastor or, or missionary or whatever um, for their work, but, uh, to, you know, to support them. But, yeah, he didn't actually accept a salary. Right. No, he, uh, yeah, and, and one of the things, again, too, just how expensive it is to send the missionaries overseas. I mean, uh, I, you know, I've been, I've heard stories. Now, I haven't been able to track them down as being accurate, but, you know, guys having to raise, you know, close to $100,000 a year. You know, for their mission work overseas. But, you know, by the time you think travel, housing, uh, medical, taking care of family, uh, and a lot of times, uh, you know, the, there's no, uh, uh, the kids wind up going to school some distance away, uh, you know, with other missionary kids in these school systems and stuff. Um, right. Plus supplies. Yeah, it can be stuff. So it All can be quite a, quite a challenge. Yeah. So I thought this, this was an interesting article. Again, it was from Wall Street Journal. Uh, and just, uh, you know, the, the, you know, a different aspect, uh, what we would call tent maker ministries. Mm -hmm. After you know, something else I really like about this is what a great way to, uh, to really get where people are, you know, mm -hmm. um, to be in people's lives and, and really the message of, um, this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately, um, is that so often and this is not an original idea with me, but um, the the sort of traditional model in uh, churches has been sort of worship focused. That our goal is to get people to worship, get people you know in church on Sunday or whatever. And um, whereas they said, really, um, our focus should be missional. Should be we should be focusing on reaching out and helping people. And, um, and, and ultimately bringing them the message of the gospel, but just going out there and loving people. And, and even our, our worship should really gear toward that as opposed to the other way around. 
and um and and you know and I've been thinking a lot about it and I'm you know I I haven't completely thought it through and and what exactly the implications are of that um there's some books out there that have been written recently on it I don't have a title um off the top of my head exiles I think is the title of one of them um but I can't remember the author's name it could be frost anyway um the just you know the whole idea of, of being out there in people's lives and showing them that faith is more than something that you do for an hour or two a week um that this is a, a lifelong um and it's something that that not just intersects your life but but runs along the same line that it's it's an integral part of your life and and i think that that this sort of uh missionary work it it exemplifies that so this i mean i i really like this mhm it's a neat program neat idea neat thought and so but you know what he might help these missionaries if they introduce romantic rivals <laughs> it's a bit of that a stretch might there, be better dude. than jobs romantic <laughs> rivals okay this was i even had a hard time understanding this story uh huh i thought this was one of the weirdest things um this is uh yeah from life science uh, from uh from fox news and um death cannot stop true love um i don't i i, I and it just seems like the weirdest study you were the strangest boy i have ever met i almost swear it was done with stimulus funds and maybe you know the 30th just <laughs> congressional district in new hampshire or something you know they could save or create a few jobs here um, because, you know, uh, um, it's 269 college students, and they said that men and women feel more religious when they saw attractive potential competitors. Yeah, not attractive potential mates, but right. attractive potential competitors. So people yeah, of the same they, sex. So we're assuming that these are, I'm, I'm assuming that they screened for... Um, for heterosexuals, I, yeah, then. I don't know. They said um, volunteers viewed dating profiles of either attractive men or women, and told them these fellow students participating on an online dating site. They are then asked to rate on a ten-point scale to which extent they agreed with statements like, "I believe in God. We'd be better off if religion played a bigger role in people's lives, and religious beliefs are important to me." And when they, when the members of their own sex were attractive, they appeared more religious. Uh? Now, one of the things uh, in a, a, a question like this is, um, you know, you always have to um, bring in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You know, sometimes I amaze even myself. Um, which says you cannot study something and really understand it at the same time. Um, or you cannot know where something is and things that, uh, that's one of the reasons transporters on Star Trek would never really work. Um, and, uh, matter of fact, uh, um, they, they had on the, if you, if you knew the breakdown of the transporter, they had a Heisenberg compensator on it. Uh, <laughs> to take care of that. But, so basically what, what Heisenberg would argue is in this case is that the um you know the, the the people doing the study uh, the students doing the study might be tempted to give the answer that they would think the researchers want to hear mm -hmm. right and and they know that being religious is a good thing so you know they might want to make them you know be more religious uh there was a very famous study on on giving uh, and, and stuff and uh, altruism show these people are extremely altruistic and everything. Um, all to the, but the problem is, is that others came finally came up with a test and showed not really they're not altruistic. You might want to think they are because uh, some of them know it's not real. And in fact, they know this is not a real situation. It's an artificial situation that also adds to the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, one of the suggestions 
as to why um, people would act more religious. Um, they they suggest a whole bunch of different things, and, and none of it really makes a whole lot of sense. Um, one of the things they said is people might say they're more religious to be more attractive, maybe exploiting a different niche uh, to find mates. Um, people might, uh, when rivals are present, since religion office invo- often involves rules that police sex. All right. Um, I ha- I mean, I have seen people basically because they were attracted to a religious person um take on that person's religion or at least uh claim to take on uh that person's faith or or claim uh to be in agreement with it um problem is i've i've seen case i mean sometimes the person you know really looks into it um for the the sake of their uh spouse and um and and decides yeah yeah this you know this really is worthwhile and um and other times i've seen where it's it's just sort of a front and then it kind of falls apart pretty quickly afterward um you know sort of uh yeah i'll i'll say that that i believe this and it's important to me and that um to get her to marry me and then once we're married, well, then that's it. And I've seen that happen and that's too bad because then it's like, wait a minute, uh, you tricked me. Why would any girl ever marry me? So, one of the, um, it says, uh, these findings dovetail with others uh, from the researchers suggesting that people's feelings about premarital sex, abortion, and birth control about mating and its potential consequences, in other words, were more predictive of their church attendance than other classical religious attitudes, such as beliefs about whether stealing or lying are right and wrong. Now, there is a correlation. Okay, people that call themselves Christian, for instance, I've heard this, I haven't heard as far as religious um, in general, but people that call themselves Christian um, have the same... um, relative uh, statistical divorce rate as anybody else, as the general populace. Um, But people who are in church on a regular basis, their divorce rate is considerably lower. I mean, like way lower. I can't remember the exact statistic, but um, like on a, uh, like a, a, 10% 10% versus 50% or something like that. So it was, it was really considerably lower. Um, I mean, it, it really, it makes a difference between just identifying yourself with an organization and actually embracing the beliefs of that organization. And for what it's worth, I would think, yeah, people's views on premarital sex, abortion, and birth control uh, probably would be more predictive of the church attendance than a lot of other things. I mean, it just makes sense. So, uh, uh, but uh, I, I don't know. I just, I, I would say you need to do a lot more study and check things out a lot more carefully before you make too many assumptions on this thing. Because I, so it strikes to me that it was just, you know, uh, uh, um, think that you always need to. Uh, bring in some some real careful ca- caveats in this kind of a study. Mm-hmm. But now, what would be interesting is when if they just did uh, uh, work with with atheists and humanists. We're living in a material world, and I am a material girl um, or boy. So this is again uh, something that uh, comes out of. Um, you know, uh, uh, this was from the institution, uh, inside higher education is what this was from. And uh, talked about how there has been, you know, all kinds of chaplains out there. A lot of schools had Christian chaplains for years, pastors, <coughs> Catholic chaplains, priests, and then Jewish chaplains, and Muslim chaplains, and Hindu chaplains. Um, and uh, now... Um, they are beginning to have humanist chaplains. Uh, 
for atheists, agnostics, and otherwise non-religious who are still interested in, in living ethical and meaningful lives. Uh, and there are, they said, three of them. One at um, Harvard, a uh, guy by the name of George Epstein, who was raised a Reformed Jew. Um, by the way, in Sharon, Massachusetts, just not too far from my house, they now have a <coughs> atheistic Jewish group. So that you can do all the cool things about being Jewish, but without having to worry about God. So, uh, you know, I thought that was kind of an interesting, <laughs> interesting group. It, but anyway, I don't know much about it. Because what's the purpose <laughs> then? Yeah, what's the purpose? But anyway, um, and then Rutgers University and Adelphi University also have uh, <clears throat> humanist chaplains. We are the future, Charles, not them. They no longer matter. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, the guy at uh, Harvard, um, uh, Greg Epstein, grew up Reformed Jewish and studied Buddhism and Taoism and is now certified as a humanist rabbi by the Harvard Divinity School. Um, the, <laughs> this is really kind of an odd thing. It's, it said, uh, this is from the uh, Ethical Society at Tufts. Uh, a lot of students might want spiritual guidance, but don't want, but don't feel comfortable going to the available chaplains on campus who might not satisfy their spiritual needs. <laughs> and I, I immediately reacted to that, and then I got two paragraphs down. It says using the word spiritual, it seems to be somewhat contradictory. You know, I mean, okay, if you don't believe in a spirit then what do you mean spiritual needs? You know, aren't you sort of <laughs> making an admission there? Um, but the point is that they're saying that um, it's what it comes down to is uh, it's an issue of, you know, meaning, um, having uh, ethical. It's chaplain at, uh, at Rutgers that is teaching a series of um, of classes. Uh, first, he introduced himself with a series of slides, the geometry of a galaxy, cave paintings, and his granddaughter, each illustrating what he considers profound truths of the human condition, our desire to know about our universe, to make our mark on history, and to survive and propagate our species. Second meeting breaks students into groups, has them discuss their own beliefs about how they fit into the universe, as well as their personal challenges, and how to meet them. Um, and at the third meeting, they invite two professors to discuss theories of ethical behavior. It says, humanism is about the whole human being. When I talk about things that inspire me, I'm talking about things that actually move me. Imagination, creativity, respect for what we find beautiful and what we find ugly. So, I don't know, it seems to be uh, almost like it's, it's for people that are looking for meaning in a meaningless world. Or meaningless uh, universe. Um, now, when I was reading over this um, the story, I thought, you know, it would be really good. I, I don't want to, um, because I'm not an atheist, I don't want to caricature atheists and sort of put words in their mouths. And so I sent out a note on Twitter and Facebook um, to get feedback. Um, all right, atheists, what is... Um, you know, how, how do you define the meaning of life? And, uh, so far I haven't gotten an answer. Although I thought I, I thought my, uh, Blackberry beeped an answer at me and, uh, but haven't actually. Well, you know better than to trust a strange computer. No. So, unfortunately I didn't get an answer. So I looked for, um, I decided, well, okay, um, you know, I'm, I'm being lazy just asking for an answer instead of uh, actually going out and looking for one. And so I did a little Googling around. And best I could come up with was, um, if you're an atheist, then why do you need meaning in life? It's like saying, um, what's the meaning of this rock? And, um, and I... You know, I, I looked all over, and then of course, you know, there's all kinds of essays and stuff that I really didn't have time to read. Um, so I apologize for that. But um, and so I'm, I'm still wondering. Right? 
atheists out there um, that may be watching this, uh, if you haven't stopped by now, um, <laughs> how do you how do you see uh, life and meaning and and um, you know do you just say well it uh, you know sort of some people say well it is what you make it out to be um, if you you can give it whatever meaning you want and um, and, and other other people uh, I don't know I guess you know they, they basically the the discussion was well. You know why? Why do things have to have meaning? Um, and I don't. Know, I, I guess I just find a lot of um, a lot of value to know that that there's a point. Um, you know. Well, that was the question Doug Adams asks in Hitchhiker's uh, Guide to the Galaxy: What's the meaning of life? Forty-two. Yeah. The ultimate, you know, ultimate view of there is no meaning to life. You know, and, and nobody ever will know. It, you know, there is, there is none. But you know, again, um, but I, which I think is a very sad thing. I mean, if we, you know, if there's no purpose to life, then then why be around? Why, why do anything? I mean, you just exist to exist. But that's what these students are trying to find. They're trying to find some sort of meaning and purpose in their lives apart from God. And as uh, Saint Augustine so beautifully reminds us. Uh, thou hast made us for thyself, but our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. So, uh, you know, you can, you know, you can, you know, talk about imagination, creativity, respect for what we find beautiful. Of course, beauty's in the eye of the holder. Uh, uh, you know, you can talk about those types of things. But ultimately, the only thing you can tell them is go out and be good people. Well, what's good? Well, we'll we'll debate what's good, mm -hmm. but uh, you you really can't give them anything more than that type of idea, right? Uh, and uh, you know they can, you know, try to find some sort of spiritual meaning, but they, you know, ultimately, they need to be pointed to Christ, and the humanist chaplains aren't going to do that. No, and 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 I mean, understand. Pointed to Christ, not so that they'll be good people, right? Most most atheists I know are very moral people. Okay, um, for you know various reasons for the you know so that society doesn't uh, mm -hmm. fall into shambles. Um, you know, it's it's basically ultimately ends up being for selfish reasons. It's, it's the idea that um, and and you know. Not to, again, not to sort of bash anybody, um, but if you're doing it for, um, because I don't want my society to crumble around me because that would make my life very difficult if it did, and so if, if the world is a better place, then that'll make my life better. Um, you know, I'm not saying that, that everyone that sort of sees things that way necessarily really actually sees, th thinks it through that far. Um, See, and, and for Christians, again, it's not a, we're not about the idea that, um, that we're being good to earn God's favor. We believe that Jesus earned God's favor on our behalf. That we're saved because of his sacrifice for us, because of his perfect life for us, not because of anything that we do. And, um, and the, and that the role of good works is, is, um, you know, I'm, I'm saved, I'm loved, I'm, you know, I, I've got, God has given me everything that I need. He will continue to provide me everything I need. I don't need to steal. I don't need to um, to kill. I don't need to uh, cheat on my spouse or, or anything else, because I, you know, I have all that I need. I am loved. I'm, and um, and so then I can take that love that has been given to me and I can share it with others, just because love is a wonderful thing to share. And um, and and because God has has loved me and and um and He says you know go go love others as I have loved you and we say okay sounds good you know and uh, and so yeah it's it's just a really different and and but the other thing is that um you know I this is something that that's been hitting me just 
lately I've been dealing with some situations here of uh, some people that are um, in in some pretty rough situations, um, major injuries um, and, and that, and, and just a lot of suffering. And uh, and it really, it, it, it tears me up to see that suffering. And um, I, you know, I've, I've got the assurance that God is with them. He's going to take care of them. I can give comfort uh, to them or where they're not conscious enough to to hear me say words of comfort to them. Um, I can say it to their families that are concerned about them, um, that, you know, God's going to take care of them and, uh, and he's with them. And, and ultimately the suffering will be replaced by the resurrection and eternal glory. And, um, so we've, we've got that hope. Um, and, and that that person that's there suffering, that's not just a bunch of chemicals laying um, on a on a bed, you know. That that that's a, that person is a special creation. A very nice brain. And and I, I really, it seems that the you know when you get into issues of um, you know end of life issues, beginning of life issues, um, that you know the practical outcome is that. Theists in general, uh, but especially uh, Christians or others who believe that um, that we are a special creation of God um, and that He loves us, that um, we tend to hold life in a greater a greater value. Um, and you know, of course, there's a, people are going to pull up all kinds of exceptions to that, um, but. If you look at the, um, you know, the sort of life issues that face our society right now, it's the Christians in general that are speaking out in favor of life and, and preserving life and, and, and holding life sacred. Hey, buddy, I'm not paying you to hear your thoughts on life. I'm paying you to sing. So that's our last story. And in kind of a heavy note, but, um, but uh, you know. It's cool stuff. And so, all right, we want to hear back from you. All right. Um, it's not, if, if there's some atheists out there that want to respond uh, to our meaning of life discussion, all right, we would love to hear from you. And, and we, you know, it's, it's not too late. We'd still like to hear from you. Uh, even if you're finding this on YouTube, you know, months from now or something like that. Um, and so you can either email us at podcast at crossfeednews.com or uh, you can leave a comment on whatever site that you're watching this on um, or listening you know we would just we'd love to hear from you and, and really appreciate your feedback and um, and and if you think that because I did get a response from one person and uh, and he didn't actually answer the question but uh, he said, I tend to find honesty and God bothering seldom go hand in hand, but good luck. Um, and so, you know, we do try to be straightforward and honest and not caricature people, which was the real, the, the whole point of, of me asking in the first place and, and trying to track this information down. Um, I, I really don't think that that's a fair way to treat people. Um, and it's, it's a horrible way if you're trying to understand another person's perspective too. And so we want to hear your perspective. So please, you know, tell us and, uh, and cause we, we want to know and, uh, and we'd like to, to discuss it. So, uh, that's it for this week. Anything that it is. And Jim? No? Nope. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. And uh, I'd like to get your feedback on V, too. <laughs> so, good night, everybody, and God bless. Good night. Take care.